For the next little bit, we're going to examine the connection between homeland security, <coughs> workforce development, and what happens in classrooms across the state day to day. And I would argue that perhaps a different secret weapon in homeland security is our teaching force. Um, the, the teachers who work with our students day in and day out um, will make that difference in the skilled, diverse pipeline. So all over the country for years now, we've been engaged in a discussion about what are the skills that are necessary for effective college and career preparation. I propose to you today this list. It's one of many. This list comes from Tony Wagner's Global Achievement Gap. It's probably familiar to most of you. And we'll use it simply to anchor our discussion about what happens in classrooms. You may argue with pieces or have other um, proposed additions, but let's just spend a second taking a look at what he says are the seven survival skills. So there's widespread agreement. When we put this slide up or people read the book for consideration, we often see a lot of nodding heads and people say, yes, that's important. Absolutely. That's what I want to hire for in my pipeline. I need um, young workers with curiosity and imagination who know how to analyze information and ask good questions. That's exactly what we need. But many times we talk about it at this big theoretical level. So today, you know, I'm a teacher by background. Let's do what I like to do best, which is get into classrooms and get very practical, very grounded in teaching and learning practice. So I ask you to consider, in your mind, an 11th grade classroom that's a US history classroom in which students are studying the Cuban Missile Crisis. They're very specific. And I want you to think that first picture that came to your head, what are students doing? What is the teacher doing? How is the classroom arranged for students and teachers to do that work? Over the last several months, I have asked this very question again and again and again and again and again to educators and non-educators alike. And let me tell you what I have heard reported back to me. It's the first image that comes to mind in 11th grade U.S. history classroom where students are studying about the Cuban Missile Crisis. a little something like this. Okay, so I pick on social studies a little bit because that's my background. I was a social studies teacher, but also because as I've interviewed person after person after person after person, what I hear is, well, in a good social studies class, the teacher's a good storyteller. And in a less than good social studies class, maybe those stories aren't so great. Um, but what is it that this example, which is clearly a caricature, but what is it that this example asked students to do other than listen, maybe, stay quiet while the teacher's talking? And those skills weren't listed on Tony Wagner's survival skills. Staying quiet while the teacher's talking wasn't one of them. Right, so let's think together about what is it that we would ask students to do if we were to intentionally develop these skills, purposefully develop these skills in classrooms, consistently, coherently. Um, so I bring another example. Let's look at uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina. <coughs> at the Wayne School of Engineering, which is one of our partner schools. And we're gonna very briefly visit the classroom today of an 11th grade social studies teacher, US history, in which they're studying the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the teacher in this class, I'll just give you a little bit of background, the teacher in the class is named Mark Mallet, <coughs> And he's been the full-time teacher of record in a public school for 18 months, when this uh, video example was taken, 18 months. And as a new teacher, 
he did something, well, a couple of things that were interesting. First, he reached out to a colleague who was a math content colleague and said, I'd really like for you to help me think about how, my, how to get my students to make some math connections around the Cuban Missile Crisis. Next, he arranged his classroom like this. Um, he called them stations. Elementary school teachers might have called them centers. Um, but it was an intentional arrangement so that students could collaborate, work together to examine some questions that dealt with the content. Uh, in the video, you'll see these different student groups working together, examining documents, um, considering, and you'll see the question that each group is working on flash on the screen first. So let's take a look at how this goes. So let's ju juxtapose with the earlier example that we saw. What did you see students doing in this very short four minute clip? Again, not theoretical. Actually, what did you notice? Active engagement. Term, active engagement in terms of uh, their analyzing the information and taking the hand up for and discussing it openly. Mm -hmm. Analyzing, discussing, uh, active engagement. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. They were also discussing, <coughs> they were not afraid to disagree, but keeping it at a even keel and, and having a discussion where you don't have to go along and just assume one person is right, kind of like the teacher at the head of the table, everything he does is correct, and you just listen to the floor. And so it was an active discussion with different times. Uh, proactive problem solving. Uh, they were clearly doing internet research, looking at uh, blast zones and calculating and coming up with definitive responses. They were provided with both visual and lecture that various learning styles were influenced in that classroom for the other one. I think by putting them into cluster groups, that they can engage with each other, and they also weren't afraid to make a mistake, whereas if you got it in front of the entire class, you may feel a lot more inhibited than you would within a, a small group that would have a, a dialogue with, you know, with each other. <coughs> and the last thing with the girl was mapping out the diameter of the Hiroshima bomb and whether it would affect her house but uh, you could see the concern on her face, her, her passion for that knowledge was at a level that was just beyond the academic. My observation is it's real life training, a real life application, uh, gaining real life experience. Thank you. So building off of that, do you want to hire these students? based on this classroom experience, not right now, but if they are able to consistently work in teams to examine problems that don't have easy answers, where they can disagree safely with one another, look for additional evidence, make an argument, make a mistake, and reconsider. Is that the kind of new employee that the, the diverse and rich pipeline that you are looking for. So again, let's consider, this is a classroom of a teacher who's been in practice for 18 months. He has more <laughs> questions than he has answers. And what I appreciate about him is that he has <clears throat> adopted what I would call a stance of inquiry about his own practice, which is precisely what we want our students to do adopt a stance of inquiry, figure out what the real question is, figure out new ways of knowing, because there's so much that is unknown. So uh, <clears throat> Mr. Malik is a risk taker in his own classroom, and he is the first to say that he doesn't have it all figured out. He's got continued questions after this lesson. He wanted to know, to what extent 
did this lesson reach every student by design? I, I attempted purposefully to design a lesson as part of a unit in which every student was asked to read, write, think, and talk. Right? Read, write, think, and talk. That is the common instructional framework that we use at the North Carolina New Schools Project to ensure that every student, and our sort of mantra, is read, write, think, and talk in every classroom every day. So that a student's experience from eight to three or nine to five or whatever their, their school hours are in your particular context is filled with invention, creativity, exploration, discussion, and problem solving, as opposed to those students who were sitting in the Ferris Bueller classroom when their day was filled with not such exciting stuff. Right? Even though there may have been good stories. So what's powerful to me about this stance of inquiry is that as part of our service at the New Schools Project, we also provide the support of an instructional coach who is a partner in that stance of inquiry. So a few days after this lesson, uh, Mark's instructional coach sat with him and said, so what were you left thinking about? Let's take a look at just an excerpt of that. So what's striking to me about this is that the job of the coach is not to go in and correct, right? Not to be the expert and say, you should have, you could have, why didn't you? But rather to be a partner engaging in the thinking and reflection and planning and next steps around instruction. So Mark continues to have questions about the extent to which his assessment aligned with his learning task. He has questions about how he could more meaningfully use technology in a way that would make sense with the purposes of the lesson. And Brenda is there to work with him, think with him, to continue that investigation because as practitioners, we will always have questions about what we're doing with kids in school. We will always continue to examine what we're doing. If we go back to the purpose of this gathering today to examine the connections between workforce development and secondary education and homeland security. Think with us, please, about that transformation in a teacher's practice. What will it take to support teachers who might have been taught the way we saw in the first video? I was. And how do we support those very same teachers to begin to think and teach intentionally for the development of those skills that we put up on the screen? Because we know that in, in skills for anything, if you're learning to play basketball, we don't learn to play basketball by listening to the coach talk about it. Right? We've got to get out there and do it. So how do we support teachers to create those learning experiences where students are doing. Students are doing and practicing and revising and considering and messing up and trying again. Because that's what I've heard from executives is a skill set that's really important in your employees. Thank you for being with us.